Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Our session today is dealing with the heart of leadership. This is in the series on the spirit of leadership. The heart of leadership. Say that with me. The heart of leadership. We're going to get to the heart of the matter today. Now I want to remind you that we use the Bible as our textbook even though there are many hundreds of books that are available on the subject of leadership. I myself have a master's degree in the area of leadership and administration. I've studied the gurus and read famous authors who have contributed much to the development of leadership thought and theory and management thought and theory. But reading all of those books, and I still read them, uh, I, this past month, July, I read three books. I almost made four. I try to make four books a month. But all the books I read this past month were on leadership, which I try to be consistent with my burden and my passion. You must become refined in the area of your gifts, so you should study that area. And the more I read these books, written by other authors, I've come to the conclusion that they stole all of their ideas from the Bible. All. And they're getting credit for it. The Bible is the most important book in the world. However, the Bible was given for, for not for information. And that's the difference. The other books are written to give you information but write this down the Bible is not for information but for transformation the Bible is written with a spirit behind it and that spirit is a sign to transform the reader not to entertain the reader you can buy science fiction books and you can buy drama books, and you can buy books of love stories, and be entertained by uh, different writers, uh, Stephen King, and others who write on horror, and all kind of drama st uh, dramatic stuff, and interesting books, you may find them entertaining, but they do not necessarily transform your life, they entertain you. But the Bible is not for entertainment. The Bible is for transformation. What we have is a multitude of informed believers, but very few transformed believers. And my goal in this series is to take you from information to transformation. A lot of us are filled with the Word of God, but the Word of God has not filled us up. We have not begun to think like the Word of God. Romans 8.26 says this, it says that God's intent for us is to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Do you see that there? He has given us everything we have to take us back to the image of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Everyone reads verse 28. They like verse 28. But this verse 26 it's very important. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We don't know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings and words that cannot be uttered. And he searches our hearts. The heart of leadership, the design of God, is to deal with the heart. Look at verse 29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn 
among many brothers. God's desire is for every human being from the beginning he predestined your image to be like the image of Jesus Christ. When God created the species called man he had rulership in mind. That was all on his mind. God made it very clear from the beginning in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 when God said let us make man the next statement of his mouth is and let them have dominion. Dominion means rulership, government, authority, leadership, power, stewardship, management, author, authorization to have control. God's thought for mankind was rulership and leadership. That means trapped in every human is the spirit of leadership and the spirit of rulership. That therefore also means that leadership is not an exclusive club for those who were born with it. Every human on this planet has an instinct for leadership. You have it, I have it. But most of us do not have the courage to cultivate that instinct because our environment has beaten us down so badly that we believe only a few special important people could be leaders while we are regulated to following for the rest of our lives. That thought is satanic. The spirit called man was created to lead, but man lost the leadership spirit. All humans possess the potential to lead, but lost the passion for leadership. We want to do better, but we don't have the courage to try. We want to go into something that we dream after, but we don't have the boldness to step up. In other words, we have the instinct for leadership, but we've lost the passion for leadership. The goal of God is to restore man's spirit to leadership, but more importantly, to restore the leadership spirit to man. The fall of man resulted in the oppression of man's spirit by the spirit of Satan. This oppression resulted in a distortion of man's image of himself and obviously of God in whose image the man was created. The spirit of man took on, the Bible says, the spirit of slavery. And believe me friends, the spirit of slavery is more dangerous than the chains of slavery. Because after you've been physically enslaved, if you never receive the spirit of slavery, then the chains cannot hold you. But if you have received the spirit of slavery, after they remove the chains, you are still in slavery. The loss of man's spirit resulted in spiritual, mental, and solical, and eventually physical oppression. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. It's a very important reference for you to note. It talks about a son thinking like a slave. And if you want to know who it's talking about, it's talking about us humans. Please turn to Galatians chapter 4 quickly. I want to read how the Bible describes every human on the planet. Tell your neighbor he's about to read about you. If you are in a hotel room, take the Gideon Bible and take it out right now. Read this with me. Right in the drawer by the lamp. Yeah, the one right there. <laughs> All right. Thank God for the Gideons. Galatians chapter 4. Now, if you read the verse right before 4, which should be the last verse of chapter 3, it says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave even though he owns the whole estate. In this chapter, Paul is talking about the spirit of sin, how the oppression of Satan has caused us who are sons of God to think like slaves. And he says that as long as the, the son is still acting like a slave, even though he owns the whole estate, 
he has the slave attitude and you will find in this next statement he says that this therefore means he must be subjected to guardians and trustees until this time set by the father so also when you were children you were in slavery under the basic principles of the world underline that word principles right in the Bible and your notes principles Paul says slavery comes from principles are you getting this this is an awesome statement he says slavery is not a matter of chains and colonialism and oppression he says you ain't a slave until it gets in your precepts until your mind begins to believe it until you become mentally damaged to the point where slavery becomes a norm where you believe you're supposed to be at the bottom where you've accepted that this is the way things are supposed to be I'm never gonna be advancing this is the way our people are when you begin to think in those principles Paul says you have been enslaved properly successful slavery is when the slave accepts the principle of oppression as normal some of you don't believe you could take your boss's job you don't believe that you even supposed to have that position well, I've come to tell you that you could own the company but you gotta have a mental brainwashing you, know, you gotta wash your brains hallelujah Paul says slavery is a mental bondage and notice he says by Satan everybody say principle you got it written down principle please write another word down principality see the connection now write another word down precept the Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood but against principalities a principality is a power that rules through principles which means Satan's number one target is your brain you thought it was your body it's your brain it's not even your brain it's the thing that's in your brain he's after and that is your what your mind if he can trap you to believing things that are not true then he has you because as a man thinking so is the man so Paul says we've been enslaved by the principles of the world speaking of course of the world that is ordered by satanic forces verse 4 but when the time had fully come God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive what the full rights of sons because you are sons God sent the what capital S spirit Holy Spirit into your spirit the spirit of who his son into what your heart man listen you gotta underline this stuff this is loaded he says the slave spirit is in your mind which means you can be born again and still be a slave it's not in your spirit it's in your mind when you're born again your spirit is re regenerated but your mind is still trapped and that is where the problem lies and that is why I will not stop ministering this word until we get it because you see you can have leadership in your spirit but not have the spirit of leadership there's a big difference between the two look at this statement very important statement he says because you are sons because you are sons God didn't trust that to be enough he sent the spirit of his son into you to do what read it into your hearts what is your heart what is your heart we get into the heart of leadership now what is your heart the subconscious mind what is your heart the subconscious mind what is your heart where does God send the Spirit of Jesus where does the Holy Ghost really want to take up residence what does he want to take over your mind this is tough for me too because I've been taught by the church that the heart is in my chest 
No wonder why I didn't change as a Christian for years. Because I've been trying to get God to change my chest. Are you getting this? In other words, we have a mindset that's suffocating the spirit of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ has sent the spirit, the capital S means the Holy Ghost, into your heart. Why? Because that's where the problem is. Out of the heart comes the issues of life. Out of the heart comes murders and strife, Jesus said. Out of what? The mind. He says if the Holy Ghost can just get that area converted, then the son will stop thinking like a slave. This is the problem. I recommend to you then to meditate on verse 6 for about two weeks. Because you are sons. Everybody say, I'm a son. Say it again. I'm a son of God. Then God says, that ain't enough. I'm going to give you a spirit. Why? Well, listen, friends. Let's be honest. You've been a Christian for many years, and you're still afraid of God. There's a difference between respect and fear. Y'all going to get this in a little bit. When the Bible says, fear the Lord, it doesn't mean when God shows up to run. But that's what we've been taught in religion. The word fear is the Greek word and the Hebrew word, and they both mean to respect or to honor or to reverence. Now, don't you respect your daddy? Of course you respected your daddy. But you didn't run from your daddy every time you showed up. You respect your mother, you reverence your mother, but you're not afraid of your mother. Now, why am I saying this? Read the last statement in that verse, verse 6. He says, the Holy Spirit got a big job to do. You are sons, but you don't call God Father. Is that right? Look at that verse. He says, you call God all kind of stuff, like awesome consuming fire killer of the wicked murderer of the unbeliever the giant of glory that walks with his fly swatter to swat the unsuspected humans who make mistakes I mean, that's your picture of God do you know what made them attack Jesus familiarity with the father my father always hear my voice how dare you, they said. You being a mere man claiming God to be familiar, Jesus says he's your father too. Now why am I saying this? Let me tell you something. If you truly, how many believe God is your father? The thing it is, I don't believe you. And God doesn't believe you. I mean, think about it. Okay, first of all, if God is your father, can you give me a few descriptions of who your daddy is? Come on, give me one. Shout it out loud. Just, I just want one word. Who is your dad? He's king. What else? Huh? He's, he's interested. No, I want to describe his character. Who is your daddy? Rich, powerful, awesome, love, miracle worker, healer, owner of universe. He owns the sheep on a thousand hills. Come on, talk to me. Faithful, protector, more than enough. Provider, love, kind. Huh? He's what? He's joy, deliverer, faithful. How much does he own? You sure? Now, all who believe God is your father, hold your hands up, please. Okay, put it down. How much does he own? But you don't act like that. So the Bible says something got to happen to you. After you are the son of God. Look at it. It's that so. Because you are the son of God. That ain't enough. God has put a spirit in you. And the spirit is working on what? Your heart. I mean they give you your pink slip. And tell you that you are fired. 
and God is your daddy. Now, right there in that office, when they give you the slip and they're telling you farewell, how do you react? I mean, if God is your daddy, God owned the person and the pink slip. But what do you do? You fall apart. Oh, what am I going to do now? Lord, I got no job and I got a rent to pay and children need food. And you get mad and cuss the people out. And you are a Christian claiming God is your father. Why? Because your mind hasn't changed yet. It hasn't gotten there yet. What it says, the spirit has a big job. What is the job? One simple job. To help you say Abba. That's a familiar term in the Hebrew. Uh, when you go to Israel today, and some of you remember me, you would hear the little kids just around the hotels, and they call their daddy. And you know what they say? Abba. This, it's, this is a normal Hebrew word. It's, it means Papa. It's, it's, a, it's an intimate term. That's why, look at it, it's written in the italics. Why? Because Paul is saying this word we ain't used to use it with God. But he said that's what God wants. If God is your father, no one can fire you. Come on, y'all talk to me. If God, <laughs> if my daddy owned the whole world and someone believed they fired me, mm, that's my daddy moving me around to something better. Just, he controlling the whole situation, just moving me around. Now, we call it firing because he knows we won't leave. Clap your hands right there. <laughs> sure. I mean, God has a way of getting you out of the cockpit. Jesus, help my mouth now. I mean, this man was a pilot. Loved it. Hung it on to it. Woo. Hat and nice shirt. Deep. God says he ain't going to leave that. So I'm going to mess up the whole thing. Why? Now he running the whole situation. The pilot's working for him. Now he can settle to be a pilot or be in charge of all the planes. Tell your neighbor, I can't be fired. I can only be relocated. Lift your hands and praise him. That's right. I tell you, they can't fire you if your father is God. It's tough to get the mind changed. It says the air thinks like a slave until the Holy Spirit can convert his heart. Then he begins to think like Abba, Pops. Do you know what Monday would be like if you got this on Sunday? Hey, glory, hallelujah. Could you imagine stepping in your car Monday morning, little Toyota broken down, but yet the God is your daddy. You pull the red light say, girl, you still driving this? Yeah, my daddy got a nice one on the way, but he tell me to take care of this while I wait. Amen. Why? Because my father told me if I'm faithful over Toyota, he'll make me a ruler over Mercedes. You see, I ain't got no problems with no Toyota. This ain't about the car. It's about who my father is. Attitude. Attitude. I'll never forget, I will never forget this experience I had. This gentleman named Mr. John Templeton lives right here in the Bahamas, multi-billionaire. And he, he wanted to see me, I went to his office. I went behind that big gate down there, life of key, walked into that place. And I saw this little young fella, old man. We walked out of there, and he probably watching this program because he's a man of God, loves Jesus. And this man walks in there in pants with a kind of hole in it, tennis shoes with holes in it, toe out, old shirt and a button up wrong. And I mean, the man here, all, and he says, Good morning, good morning. Now, I'm looking at him and I'm dressed real nice, you know, and I ain't got nothing. Come on, talk to me. This brother got everything and he ain't dressed up. And I'm sitting there going, Something wrong here. I look the part, he is the part. And the Lord says, he knows who he is, so he don't need to put on. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 
<laughs> See, some of y'all put on Sunday because Monday ain't got nothing. <laughs> when you know who your father is, you ain't got to, you know, fake nothing. Hey, you know, I'm only typing here for a little while. You know, I ain't working for this mechanic shop for a while. I like it's one of my own business and I'm my own mechanic. I'm just learning some things. My, my dad owned this one and that one. He has to change our minds. But I tell you, the fall messed us up so badly. The entire redemptive program of God, I wanted to write this down. The entire redemptive program of God was to provide the means to restore to man the spirit of God. That's exactly what Jesus wanted. That was the whole game. Everything God did in Christ was to restore the spirit of God back into man. Because that's what man lost. And therefore man could not think like his father because he didn't have his father's spirit. What is the spirit of God? The spirit of leadership. God is never oppressed he's never depressed God has never been ruled by anybody and that's the spirit that he put in you that's where you came from now God has a challenge his challenge is to cultivate the spirit of leadership in the human spirit and how through the Holy Spirit that's why it's written there in Luke chapter 24 verse 49 Jesus said I will send the promise of my father, which is the Holy Ghost, but stay in the city until you receive power from on high. Acts chapter 1. Uh, please turn to Acts chapter 1. We got to read this one. This one has been, in my view, very gravely misunderstood. Even by me. I have been preaching some things with partial knowledge over the years. Thank God for progressive knowledge. When we read Acts chapter 1, we always think of power. And we think of the Holy Ghost power. And we think of miracles. And we think of people being healed and slain. And, and all this good miraculous stuff. But do you know I've become to understand that this has been probably the least part of it. That's not what Christ was really after. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1, it says on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command verse 4 do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the promise or the gift my father promised which you have heard of me and what I spoke about all the time John baptized you with water but in a few days you know the gift I told you about yeah you shall be baptized with that gift which is the Holy Spirit now underline the statement which you have heard me speak about underline that do you know what that statement implies in the in, in the Aramaic this, this portion is written in Aramaic it actually is you know Luke was was an expert doctor and Luke wrote this book and in the original manuscript it is written this way which I can constantly kept on saying to you in other words we have not seen the full message of Jesus even as Luke says and we wrote him down we just fill out all the books in the world but apparently, he spoke more of the Holy Ghost than anything else. He said, I kept telling you about this promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. In other words, my entire message, everything that I want to do is to do with this ghost, this spirit. Why? Because everything is about this spirit. If I can get this spirit back in you, then my job would have been successful. And then when the spirit is back in you, now he got a job. You know, Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then in John chapter 6, he says, For spirit gives birth to spirit, and flesh gives birth to flesh. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. They are born from the spirit. Who was he talking to? Nicodemus. Who was Nicodemus? An old man. An expert in the law. A religious man. This man knew the law. He knew, 
He knew the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, studied by Moses. That was a requirement for a rabbi. He also knew the Torah. He studied all the prophets and all the minor and major prophets. He knew Daniel. He knew all of these great people. He memorized the scriptures of Isaiah. To be a, a rabbi, you knew the word. Matter of fact, the Bible says he was an expert in the word of the written law of God. And yet Jesus said, you ain't saved yet. What am I getting at? You have information. But there's no transformation yet. And I'm talking to you believers. You are born again even, but you still ain't changed. Now this man wasn't even born again. Christ says, first, you need a spirit in order to begin the change. Nicodemus was missing the stuff that makes you a leader. He missed the spirit of the law. Those of you who are lawyers, you know that in this room there's a big difference between the law and the spirit of the law. Hello? The law is the hard written document on the paper. I mean, you, could, you can manipulate that stuff, but the spirit of the law, you can't touch that. And the spirit of the law is only in the person who wrote it. That's why it's tough to be a successful, complete, righteous lawyer. Because you're dealing with cases written by people who are dead and you can't consult them about what they meant. That's why a, a judge is called a judge. He doesn't know what it really meant, so he got to judge it. Are you with me? And I guess what I'm saying is Nicodemus knew all the words about who he was. But he could not become who God says he was to be because he needed the spirit of the one who wrote the words about him. God says, you are my son. But now for him to get you to believe that, he got to put the spirit of that in you and then convince you. And that takes a long time, especially when you've been a slave for 6,000 years. The point is, Nicodemus said, Jesus said, you must be born of the spirit. For that which is spirit, is spirit in other words you are a spirit what I said about you is spiritual and only the spirit can reveal what I said to your spirit and when your spirit get it that means your body will get it and your whole life will get it it's not enough then to mentally assent to the Word of God you need to have the spirit of those words in your life I want you to turn quickly to the book of John chapter 20 verse 21 and 22 it says a very interesting statement about Jesus Jesus Christ came to earth he lived here for three and a half years in ministry he was 33 and a half years old when he died on the cross for our sins for those three and a half years of ministry you know what he did he went about doing good the Bible says healing the sick raising the dead, cleansing the leper. And then it says he gave his life as a ransom for many and he shed his blood on the cross to redeem many. And then the Bible says in the Last Supper, he took the cup, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Remember my blood, seal the covenant. Then he says, my body, this is my body which is broken for you to, be, to heal you. And then he says, I'm doing this for you. I'm dying for the world to save the world. Why did he die? He died because... We need to be forgiven, we need to be cleansed, we need to be redeemed, we need to be sanctified. Now, God did all of that for one reason. When Adam fell, Adam lost the spirit of God, which is the spirit of rulership, which is the spirit of leadership. So, Jesus came to put back what Adam lost, that's all. That's why it's called restoration, to restore what was lost. So all of this great work of God was not just for you to have church services and to have choirs and to sing. That wasn't the deal. The deal is to get the ghost back in you. To put back what you lost. So the whole thing was about the spirit of God that you lost. Your body was contaminated by sin. Sin was in your rebellious spirit in Adam who rebelled against God's will. So we were born sinners. Christ shared the blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So we needed blood, so Christ provided that. And then the wages of sin is what? 
debt. So in order to get over debt, he also got to create the resurrection power. So he goes to the grave, comes back. So we got two things come. One, our sins can be cleansed because of the blood. And now we can also overcome death so we can come back from the grave. But the third thing is, he went back to hell and he did some stuff that's very important. He got some keys. Sit up straight and say amen. Now the keys represent some power. Glory, hallelujah. These are keys over what? Death, hell, and the grave. He grabbed those keys and came back and then he says, all power. This thing is about what? Power. But not it's not power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, all that stuff. Help me, Lord. Let me ask you a question. If man had never fell, would there be any healers, miracles, casting out demons? No. In other words, the Holy Ghost was never really given originally to deal with the devil. See, everybody want power. I want power so I can have a ministry. It ain't about ministry. If we had never fallen, you wouldn't have. I wouldn't be a pastor. My job comes from your fall. Hello? I mean, all these people making money of casting out demons and giving prophecies, they better thank God for sin. Come on. If there was no sin, you couldn't go around proper lying and collecting money. You, 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 you couldn't go around healing people and be being famous. This ain't about fame. It ain't about power. This thing hit me the other day. God says, God says, the Holy Ghost was never given to deal with the devil. The Holy Ghost was given to help you fulfill your dream. Your vision, your purpose. That's why young men dream dreams when they get the Holy Ghost and old men see visions when they get the Holy Ghost. Why? In other words, young men dream dreams. Right, right. Okay, you got it. In other words, the Holy Ghost is for your dream. Do you understand? The power is for you to fulfill your dream, to fulfill God's assignment. Now when the devil gets in the way, you use the power on him, and we call that ministry. That ain't ministry. That's just moving the guy out of the way. Hello, somebody. And when you go to set people free from the devil, you use what? The power of the Holy Ghost. But that is not the purpose for the Holy Ghost. Because if man had never fallen, he would still be filled with the Holy Ghost. So why have it in the first place? Because of the assignment. Have dominion. What is dominion? Leadership. The purpose for the Holy Spirit is to fulfill your leadership responsibility. I hope you're getting this. That means, that means, see, let me tell you why this is important. Because a lot of you think, if I'm not in the five-fold ministry, then I'm not doing something important. If I'm not a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher, then I cannot serve the Lord. That is a lie from the devil. Matter of fact, those five jobs are products of sin. Their job is to help you discover your, your purpose in God. According to the word of God, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher was given to train the saints to discover and work their own ministry, which is what? Their giftings that God gave them and the power God was given to them to fulfill that assignment. So the anointing of God in your life is not for you to just go about and look for people who, who to get healed or something. As a matter of fact, uh, you, Jesus healed people so they could go do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, am I making sense? The blind man at the gate begging for money. Jesus says, look, this man could work. Only thing is, there's a blindness in the way. So the miracle <laughs> became necessary because the purpose was being hindered. That's why it's so exciting to have the Holy Ghost because if God told you to start a business and there's resistance and opposition and problems, the Holy Ghost kicks in. God, I mean, he started moving people, changing hearts. He started getting into people's faces. He started working miracles. Not for you to walk around saying you're a miracle worker, but so you can get the job done. 
Hello, somebody. That is why the power was given. Let's read this. It's very important to understand that, that the praise for the Holy Ghost. You see, it says in Acts chapter 1, oh, sorry, John. Yeah, John 20, verse 21. It says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he what? Breathe on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This was after everything was over. He said, I've been waiting for this all my life on earth. He said, this is the moment. Everything was for this. <laughs> receive. Everybody say, receive. receive. Say it again, receive. receive. Write the word down, receive in capital letters, please. Very slowly. R-E hyphen C-E-I-V-E. -E. Get it? Now the word receive is a grammatical construct it's a word with a prefix the word is sieve re is the prefix sieve means to have it's an old old Germanic word re means to return to the original prefix so when you say sieve it means you're giving something for the first time but when you say receive, you are putting something back that used to be there. So when Christ said to them, receive, he was saying, you used to have the spirit. Now I can officially restore the spirit, which will help you regain your leadership mentality so you can cry Abba. You know, we fall so far from the Lord since this, the, the, the sins of Adam that when we receive something we always had before, we have a thrill. <laughs> God said, what's going on? This is, this is always in you. I just put it back. I mean, <laughs> you put your a new battery back in, your, you, know, you take the battery out, you charge it, put it back, and the car goes, <gasps> Woo! Because we've been so long without him. We think it's new. And he has to retrain us all over again. We have to learn how to be like our father again. You know, Billions of dollars are spent every single year in institutions all over the world. And they are training thousands of would-be leaders in management techniques and organizational skills. They are learning how to manipulate humans professionally with theories and methods of control and, and all kinds of persuasive uh, mechanisms to use to control people. That's what the universities are teaching our, our leaders. And they are spending billions of dollars on this. And yet the quality and the standard of leaders are decreasing. Which means something's missing. The question is, why do we have so much money being spent on leadership and we got the poorest quality of leaders in history? Because something is wrong. Well, you could answer it this way. The question is, why are Christians going to church for years and ain't changing? It's the same problem because they're getting the information but they're not experiencing the transformation. Why? Because there is a little thing missing. Leadership is not a technique, a method, or a style of acquisition of skills. But leadership is the manifestation of a spirit. Make a note of that. A leader doesn't try to be a leader. You can always tell when a person has finally connected. They, they don't fake anything. They don't try to lead. <laughs> a leader doesn't have to put on a power tie. She doesn't have to wear a nice suit with a brief to look leadership. Uh, when a person is a leader, it happens on the inside. Something connects and they got a revelation about themselves. 
And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter where they live, what they got or don't have. Suddenly the attitude kicks into one spirit that you can't understand. And all of a sudden they begin to see poverty as opportunity. Difficult, difficulty as challenge rather than danger. They, they, all of a sudden the attitude changed. Same person, same environment, but everything looks different when the spirit hits you. I'm talking about myself too. I'm hey. <laughs> People call things problems. I have no problems in life. None. I used to have problems until I connected with who I am. When the Holy Ghost showed me who I am and what God made me to become, I became a dangerous man. I mean, you, you, you take away my house, my car, my clothing, you know, take away everything, no problem. Get it all back, you know, and get it all back. Why? Because it ain't about them things. It's about what's happening on the inside of me. It's not what happens to you that matters. It's what you do about what happens to you that matters. Leadership is the manifestation of a spirit. The Bible says, as a man think it, so is he. Man is a spirit being, and the nature of his spirit dictates the nature of the manifested man. Until man's spirit is changed, the man is unchanged. That's why leadership begins in the spirit of the man. If his spirit doesn't get it, then the man will never get it. Please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want to reread his scripture. <laughs> reread. Uh, have you ever studied the word read while you're finding that? First Samuel chapter 10. Anyone ever saw the word read written down carefully? <laughs> Come on, you got to be careful what you read. Even when you read, read. Read is a deep word. When you read, you what? You re-add. That's the way the word is spelled, right? Re, prefix, add. When you read, you re-add to your knowledge. <laughs> That's why reading is so important to life. The more you read, the bigger you become. You keep adding to yourself. And the more you read, the bigger you become. And a man or woman who reads will always become bigger. Write this down. He who does not read is no better than he who cannot read. Get it? He who does not read is no better than he who cannot read. So I'm not impressed with the fact that you can read if you're not reading. Write this down. A leader is a reader. They are one. If you're going to lead, you got to read. If you're going to be a leader, you got to become a reader. Shut that TV off. Read. Run away from your friends. Go hide in the beach and read. Get away from the telephone. Put it on the, on the wall and read. Young people, believe me, read. And you become a lead. And you older people, some of you are thinking, you do old to read. That's why you do old to lead. A leader is a reader. The more you know, the more God will trust you with. Where did that come from? God's talking to some people here. First Samuel chapter 10. Look at this verse. Verse 6, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power. And afterwards you will prophesy. And you will be changed into a different person. Glory, hallelujah. Once these things are fulfilled, that means once this spirit comes on you, and you change into another person 
then do whatever your hands find to do. Why? The Lord is with you. Man, that's a powerful scripture. You should pull that out and put it on your bureau. The Bible says the Holy Spirit comes on you not to tickle you and to tingle you. His goal is to make you what? A completely different person. Now when you become the different person, then you'll get visions, prophecies. Then it says, whatever comes to you, when the Spirit changes you, do it. Why? God's with you. And that's heavy stuff. The Holy Ghost is supposed to give you some big ideas when you change your thinking. When you go through the transformation, you're going to go through some visions and dreams, and God's going to say, try it, I'm with you. <laughs> so, oh Lord, please be with me. I'm with you. It's me who's giving you the idea. Wow. Whatever your hands find to do, that doesn't sound too safe. Oh Lord, I need, I need to know what you want me to do. Whatever you're thinking, do it. I'm with you. Why? Because my Holy Ghost has come over you and has overshadowed you and has changed you into a different person. Now you can always tell when you ain't changed. How? If you still don't believe, what are you telling you? You don't get that yet. He says when the Holy Ghost changes you, then suddenly you're going to see some things to do. He says, do it. I am with you. Which means that if you see what to do, but you keep saying it can't be done, you ain't changed yet. Holy Ghost hasn't got your mind straight yet. Because God will never tell you something that you cannot do. Let me tell you what my passion is this year and next year. My passion is to see every member and follower in this ministry take on the spirit of leadership in the mind. And, and, and you can tell when it ain't there. I mean, when people are still not doing a job because it's someone else's job, they haven't gotten the spirit of leadership yet. When a piece of paper is on the ground in the lobby and you go and ask for the janitor, you ain't got the spirit of it. It ain't there yet. You ain't got the spirit of it. When you see something dirty on the wall and you don't want to paint it, you ain't got the spirit of leadership yet. Understand me? When something could be done better but you're satisfied, you ain't got it yet. Oh. And that has, that has to enter everybody when you quit right in the middle of a project you ain't got the spirit of leadership yet you know on my laptop uh, I have my screensaver and on my screensaver my computer the statement I wrote there leaders finish and that may sound important to you but it is to me a leader finishes things. They, they don't just start and quit in the middle. A leader completes assignments. That's leadership spirit. They don't stop until they are finished. They tie it, but they still go in. But it ain't there yet. People get you mad, you're still going. They don't treat you right, you're still going. Why? Because you ain't doing this for nobody. You're doing this for an integrity that you make commitment to yourself and to God. It's bigger than environment. That's leadership. Leaders never have excuses. Write that down. You know, I ain't never going to believe you a leader and tell you ain't got no excuses. That's the biggest example of a leader. A leader will never tell you, I'm sorry. Why? Because he ain't got no excuse. People find a million reasons why they ain't do something. You ain't no leader yet. Leaders do not find excuses. They may have a reason, but not an excuse. Study Jesus, man. What a, what a guy. He never had to say he was oh, sorry. Matter of fact, his big words were, it is finished. His attitude was, I listen, I came to do the works of my father.
My father works, so I work. My father is always working, so I'm always working. I work the works of him that sent me. So don't bother me. I'm working. Don't disturb me, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. Don't fool with me. I'm working. I'm busy. I got to finish the work the Father gave me to do. Listen to him. I got to finish the work, he says, the Father gave me to do. I got to finish the work. A leader has a finishing spirit. But you ain't there yet. We don't work as a leader. We work for people. And so if people get us mad, we could work. The leaders ain't like that. It, it, it's a spirit. What I'm trying to get at is, we, no one got to tell you to do something when you are the leadership spirit. When you get a spirit of leadership, you just look at things and you know they need fixing and you fix it. Or you know something needs to be done and you do it. I mean, a leader is always advancing things, even by their own initiative. Followers wait for assignments, but I finish that and wait till they come and tell me what to do next. You ain't no leader. You ain't there yet. You're just born again. That's all. You haven't gotten the spirit of the Holy Ghost anointing in your mind yet. Initiation. If you got the spirit of leadership, it shows up on your job. It, they start writing good reports about you. Because why? You've become a completely different person. So boy, you sure come to work earlier than necessary. You leave later than is demanded of you. Some days you don't even go for lunch. You just bring your sandwich, eat at the desk because you want to keep working. Man, you, you, you're a different kind of person. Some folks can't wait for lunch. They pray for lunch time. Oh, Jesus, let it come quickly. You ain't no leader. I mean, be fast and pray for vacation. Let it come quickly, Lord. Vacation come along now. Yeah, I got three weeks this year. I'm going to take all of them. I mean, maybe you need them. But what's your attitude toward those days? Do you want them because you're tired? Or you want them because you're tired doing nothing? The Bible says the rest of a laborer is sweet. In other words, you should rest after you labored, worked, you done something, you, you achieved something, you deserve a break. Some folks are on eternal break and getting paid for it every single week. They just, you know, they just, <laughs> matter of fact, they, they take a break to do some work. And that's when the big boss comes down from Canada. And because he's a different color, they're afraid. Attitude. Spirit of leadership doesn't need external motivation. The spirit of leadership is motivated because of a revelation of who you are and how you're supposed to be. I'm supposed to be excellent. This is my nature. I'm just like my daddy. He's excellent. What a spirit. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart. And your mind, for out of it flows what? The issues of life. What a powerful statement. In other words, until it gets into your heart, it will not change you. Your thought life is the source of the transformation. And your thought life gets its information from words, pictures. Words carry thoughts that transmit concepts which create life. And a thought, as you know, you've been told, is a silent word. But a word is an exposed thought. So whenever you hear things, people are transmitting thoughts to you. And they're becoming a part of your heart. Therefore, words are the source of life. Write that down. Words create your life. Be careful what you read and listen to. Because you're creating your own life. You, right now, are a sum total of all the words you've heard all your life. That's what you are. And what you believe about those words that transmitted those thoughts is exactly what you are becoming and continue to become. You believe and therefore belief begins with the words you hear. That's why Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. The source of your thoughts are more important than your thoughts. 
And I said this last session, I want to say it again. This thing is becoming so important to me. Write that down, please. The source of your thoughts are more important than your thoughts. Because the source of your thoughts determine the quality of the thoughts. And the quality of the thoughts can determine the quality of your life. Because as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. So whoever controls the man's thoughts controls the man's life. Therefore, the source is more important than the thought. That is why it also says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, consequently, faith comes by hearing. We know that. Whatever you hear brings belief. But then it says your belief should come from the word of God. In other words, let the source of the information be God and no one else. Because only God knows the product. He's the manufacturer. He made you. He knows you better than anybody else. And if God tells you something about you, it's the truth. Hello, somebody. And the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. That means if you get your information only from men, you are living a lie. You're becoming a lie and you are manifesting a lie in your own life. But if you hear the information from the truth, from the source, from the original, then you become what he intended you to become. And that is why to change a man, you must change the thoughts in his heart. Say this with me. If I'm going to change, my thoughts must change. If my thoughts are going to change, then the source of my thoughts must change. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. Oh, you, you got to read this one for yourself. This is too awesome. Oh, hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. One of the most powerful books in the Bible is Ephesians. And Ephesians deals with the heart, the spirit of the man. And look at this, verse 23. Ephesians 4, verse 23. Everybody has it? I want you to read this with me. Very important. It says, <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, let's read from verse 20 to get a context. You did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your mind. How many Bibles here say that statement? Let me see your hands. If your Bible says attitude, hold your hands up, please. Come on, hi, hi, hi. Everybody look around. Okay. All right. You must be reading the NIV. Okay. Now, some of you got the King James Version. What does it say? Isn't that interesting? Spirit of the mind is the same as what? This is where we get this whole series is going. That's what it's about, Pastor Richard. See, having the spirit is one thing, but having the attitude is a different story altogether. This is written to Christians. Ephesians, a church at Ephesus, and Paul says, you, you haven't gotten the attitude yet. He says, put off the old way of thinking. You're born again. You got the Holy Spirit. You're speaking in tongues. But your attitude, come on, talk to me. It takes an attitude to pick up a piece of paper and you ain't the janitress. It, an attitude picks that up. You hear me? If you ain't changed, you, you call in for the janitor. Why? That ain't my job. Attitude. He says, put on the new attitude of your minds and put on the new self. Look at that. The Holy Ghost shall come upon you and shall change you into a what? A different person. Brother, if you've been born again and you're still thinking like a slave, acting like a follower, you're still timid and intimidated by people, then you ain't got it yet. I dream of a church of 3,000 people that frighten everybody. 
Why? Because they ain't afraid of nobody, ain't afraid of no situation, ain't afraid of no challenge. Nothing is impossible to them. And they know that they're going to overcome no matter what the situation is. And if anything falls apart around them, the rest of them say, let's watch and see how she overcomes this because she's one of us. You know, to, to see that kind of people is God's dream. That's what the attitude of the mind is all about. Until it gets into the attitude, man, we're still working on threats. Hello? You threaten people to do things, and warn them to do things, and you gotta pay them more money to do things, and you gotta sweet them up to do things, you gotta be careful how you speak to them, you gotta be, you know, protect their emotions. I mean, stuff! Holding back the power of God. I mean, you know, you. You're afraid what to say, because if you say, it may hurt the feelings, and then they may leave, you don't see them no more. And so you lie when you really want to tell them something. Why? Because they're not leaders yet. Let me tell you something. Trust me. A leader is the most difficult person to hurt. I tell you, I am one. You can't hurt a leader. You, you can tell. If you still get hurt, you ain't there yet. You ain't got the spirit of a leader yet. You cannot hurt a leader. I studied Jesus for the last three years, man. Every single chapter I'm studying, the spirit, the ultimate, I'm studying this guy. And he showed me, you can't hurt a leader. They call him a bastard. But we are not. Coolest cucumber you ever seen. The Bible says, and Jesus said unto them, you can say anything you want about the Son of Man. <laughs> I mean, they just call him a bastard. Why? Because a leader already knows who they are. Some of you hear me say for years, to a leader, your opinion means nothing. That's the truth. Why? You can only have an opinion if a person is open to receive it. That's why they call it your opinion. It ain't theirs, it's your. What you think about me? It ain't supposed to touch me if I'm a leader. But it has to get here in the spirit of your mind. That's why leaders are tough to get rid of. They keep coming back. There's a little woman. Oh, this woman hit me this week. I was reading this chapter on, on the woman who came to the judge. You know, it, it wasn't about no woman and no judge. He was talking about the spirit of leadership. This little woman ain't had much, man. Poor woman. But she had the spirit of leadership. Why? Uh... Let me tell you why. We read in Galatians 4, a little statement I didn't emphasize. It says, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart to teach you how to say, Abba, Father. But the next statement we didn't emphasize was, so that you might know what are your rights as sons of God. Everybody say rights. Man, that's important. When you discover who you are in Christ, who you were born to be, a leader, a dominator, and you got rights to the planet and it's yours, then it makes you audacious. Biggity. Come on, I'm, I'm talking what I know. You, <laughs> the woman walked to the judge and says, I want this. The judge, the Bible says, the judge didn't like nobody, didn't favor nobody, didn't care for nobody. Many other people came to that judge, they were intimidated, they left. The judge cussed them out. They walked out, never came back. But this little woman, <laughs> she was a pest. And that's what I want to be. I want to be a pest to anything standing in the way of God's purpose for my life. I want to pest it out of my way. That judge got sick of this woman. He, she kept coming back, Jesus said, and she kept coming back. And the judge says, if I don't give her what she demands, she will wear me out. How bad do you want your dream? No. How sure do you believe the dream belongs to you? That's the question. If it's God's will for you to go to college, because you need that degree to fulfill his will, then I tell you, man, no teacher, no report card could stop you. 
You go back and take exam again and again. My, they can say, let's let her in because she keep coming back taking this exam. Let's let her in. Leaders do not quit. They know it's theirs. You have a right to that dream that you go and act. God put that in your heart. And it may take 20 years, but the judge is going to let you have it. Because the judge is going to be irritated by your persistence. Because your persistence is not motivated by some, you know, uh, 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 attempt to impress people. It's motivated by the fact that you know you got a right to do this thing. This is yours by right. God's will is so important for us to understand it. Once we know God's will for our lives, we become dangerous. And it has to do with the mind. I surrender. When I, when I read this, it says, put on the new man. <laughs> Verse 23. Boy, I tell you, this is too wonderful. You all learn anything this morning? Are you sure? Well, your pastor, I love each one of you so much. Individually, I want to see everybody a terror to the devil and a trophy for God. I want to see... <laughs>
nosed, picky head. But now, I am fearfully. Woo, I am wonderfully made. Check it out. Marvelous. He still had freckles. But they were marvelous freckles. Come on, somebody. My legs still bow, but it's a holy bow. Woo! Sanctified big hips. Don't fool with me. Oh, come on, clap your hands. Praise the Lord. We got to get it in the spirit of the attitude. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.